Just to bring out uh, what's happening here in our present day village, this began in 1967. After the lands were seized in 1961 and sold off, uh, there was not one village left that could become a museum. This purchase property here had been bought in 1908 as part of the original part of the purchase that Peter Verrigan made and uh, it had been reserved for cultural and educational purposes. So it was logical that we could build a museum here. And so what we have here is a reconstruction of the villages that once uh, were so familiar. Uh, they were recycled from two other villages basically. And just for general information, there were 60 such villages as this uh, throughout this area and 30 in the Grand Forks area. Each village was meant to support up to 100 people. They had their own gardens, their own fruit trees, their own chickens, their own animals, horses, cows, and so on. Horses, because everything was horse logging at the time. The horses were raised in Alberta and brought here. And uh, the uh, cows were for milk and cheese and butter. The Dukabors were vegetarians. This was part of their nonviolence uh, towards society. Peter Verrigan said, uh, our motto is toil and peaceful life. And so we will live in harmony with our fellow creatures, which includes the animals, and with nature. Uh, so he believed in farming, he believed in being close to the e ecological system that they lived in. Everything was recycled, there was no garbage uh, throughout the villages. Each village uh, had two big houses and 35 to 50 people, extended family, lived in each one. This was a communal dwelling. This would have been one of them, except for the purpose of our museum. It's now an audiovisual gallery, obviously. But the other one that you will go to is set up like it was in those days. So you'll see the kitchen, you'll see the exhibits in the bedrooms upstairs, and so on. Then these outlying buildings would have been work buildings. So you had a place where you're doing fruit preservation. You had a place where the grain storage is there. You have a harness shop. You had an infirmary. So each little building helped the community. And the gardens would be on the outside. There would be the barn. There was a blacksmith shop, which you will see here today. And there was a general wash house, which is the other place with a, it has a washroom in it. And it is a big, basically a big sauna. In Russian, it's called banya. But here, here they would be bathing themselves, the, the babies, washing clothes, etc. And this was a big weekend activity that went on on Saturdays. Okay? So, um, I will be happy to answer any questions. And uh, after that, I will just set you free to wander through all these spaces. And one thing more, outside there, we're just renovating, we call it an improvement area, the, uh, the uh, implement shed. And so you'll see all the, all the implements are pulled out there and so on. But also another reason we are is just yesterday from the museum in Nelson, we brought forward a carriage that Peter Verrigan used to use. So you'll be interested to look at it. It dates back to about 1910 and has been basically been in storage since 1924. In 1924, Peter Verrigan was killed. A mysterious assassination. Uh, between here and Grand Forks, a train explosion that killed not only him, but eight other people. Uh, this is kind of an enduring mystery. Nobody knows who did this, how it was done. There are very many different reasons. And those of you that are on the internet can look it up and look at a site called Unsolved Mysteries. Mm -hmm. And that certainly uh, is unsolved. And in a way, it marked the demise of the community in 1924, because by 1938 it was no longer existing. Now, question. During the Second World War, uh, because of your the Duke of War's beliefs in pacifism, what did they do? Well, them? during it was it was very strange, and I can speak on to that for a couple of minutes. They were exempt from military service, and one of the provisos was you had to be a card-carrying member of a recognized society. Now, they were here, it was the CCUB, the Christian Community of Universal Brotherhood. Uh, the Duke of Bars that stayed behind in Saskatchewan had formed societies, they had these necessary cards. But, the local magistrates uh, were appointed at that time and they were basically retired RCMP officers. Uh, some of them were retired post <coughs> office officers or masters. 
and so on. So the interpretation of the Conscientious Objector Act was kind of left up to the local authority. And these people were not legal people. They didn't know the act. And as far as they were concerned, you know, everybody was supposed to be serving. So basically, when the Duke of Orleans said, I'm a conscientious objector, okay, you must go to prison. So many of them went to prison. I have relatives that were actually in the Lethbridge jail there uh, during the war. But, you know, they were nonviolent resistors. I had one great uncle there. He ended up to be the, one of the chief truck drivers within the prison. You know, he just carried on a job. And there was, those in Saskatchewan were sent up to build roads. Uh, in northern Saskatchewan, in Larange and, and, and that area. Others said, okay, if you're not going to uh, be in the army, you have to pay the Red Cross. So if you paid $30 a month to the Red Cross, which at that time was a considerable amount of money, uh, then you were allowed to, to continue. Others, uh, my father was a farmer, rancher, in Alberta at the time, they said, uh, okay, you're, you're in an essential industry. The essential industry was farming and ranching, producing food. I mean, my goodness, I, I've heard many stories how, how we were saving Britain by sending all of our wheat over there and so on and so forth. Here, you had Cominco and the, and the dams on the, on the power projects, so they were working in essential industries. So they, they were exempt. And so it was a very loose... <laughs> kind of uh, interpretation on the local level. And, and, that's, and actually, you know, many people in Saskatchewan were really afraid they were going to have to go to war. And remember, this goes back to World War I, too. They, they came here in uh, 1899, you know, 1908, and so on. So World War I was a big issue with those 14, 16, to 1917. So that, so that was a big one, too. What was yes. the relationship of the Duke of Wars with the Japanese Canadians? With? With the Japanese Canadians. Okay, I can tell you a little bit about it. Uh, many of you have heard of uh, <coughs> David Suzuki, famous uh, naturalist and uh, environmentalist, I would call him now, although he was a gen you know, very uh, prominent genetic scientist of his day. I remember listening to him on CBC Radio. He had a, a program, and it was basically dealing with genetics. He, would, he and others were interned along here up towards uh, as far as uh, New Denver was a famous place, the Nikai Center. Did you go there? Yes. Okay, so, so you know about that. But between there and here and in the other direction as to, as to Greenwood, uh, there were many other internment camps. Now the Duke of Ors saw these uh, Japanese people being put into camps and they naturally assumed that they were pacifists. <laughs> they weren't going to war. You see, and they helped them. They, they helped them. They, they, they brought them vegetables. They brought them bread. The, you know, and because of the Japanese diet, as far as they were concerned, they were vegetarians too. So they, they befriended them. And, you know, to go, go back to David uh, Suzuki now, his first girlfriend was a Dukabor. It was uh, one of the neighboring Dukabors that, that he had met, and he was just a, a young guy at the time. And interestingly <coughs> enough, he will be coming here to speak at, at the Duke of Or Cultural Center uh, this fall, uh, around the time of the International Day of Peace in September. So yeah, there was a relationship, uh, and, and it was it, having to do with diet and pacifism and, and so on. And I've heard many stories of, of when the Japanese came, and they, you know, they came like when the Duke of Ors came, there were no gardens, there was nothing. So they brought them vegetables and, and kind of helped them as much as they could. Yes, they were sympathetic. Yes, sir. How were decisions made in the community? Was there an assembly? Uh, <clears throat> there was the Christian Community of Universal Brotherhood. It was incorporated as a, as a holding company under the Canadian government. It was incorporated with $1 million capital in 1917. Uh, Peter Verrigan was chairman of the board. Uh, gathered around him were a board of directors of 12 people and they would be covering the areas from Saskatchewan to BC to Alberta and so each local area like say there I'm in a village here this was all orchard here and there were three or four villages there were 12 villages where the airport is now uh, so they would they the the cluster of villages of say four each village would have an elder sometimes two elders. Then the four between them would decide who the, the group elder will be 
to represent the four villages. And so it was like a cell that went up to the higher level until you had the final 12 directors with Peter Verrigan as chairman. So, so it was a, a typical, kind of a typical board uh, of, a, you know, of a working company. And this is the interesting thing about Peter Verrigan because he was the spiritual leader. They called him Lordly, Peter Lordly Verrigan. He wrote hymns, he wrote psalms. He was a very, very intelligent man uh, in a spiritual sense. Uh, he loved the singing. He knew all of the, the living book, they called it. You know, most of the Duke of Wars were of an oral culture. They didn't read or write, but their memories were good. Everything was, was there. So he was not only very adept at all of this, but he was also a very shrewd and capable business businessman. Uh, for this, he was even resented by a lot of the local people because he would, he would bring in carloads. You'll see in the... In the in the communal building there, uh, a stove. Well, they were camp, <coughs> camp stoves. And he said, okay, every village should have a camp stove. So the railway comes and all of a sudden, there's a hundred stoves from Ontario. Well, this of course cut out your middleman here who was trying to sell hardware and so on. So there was a little bit of uh, resentment against him for that. But he was very, very shrewd in running the entire community. And remember, not only here, but in Alberta and in uh, Saskatchewan, and he knew each little section, where it was planted, how to rotate, he developed the crop rotation, for example, all of this sort of thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, now do you own land as a communal? There is no communal ownership. Oh, then now, every, now it's every all single person owns a, uh, a, some land? Yeah, oh yes. Oh. And, and now it's totally individual. So I. I I, I would say the Duke of Ors are very much integrated into the society, if not necessarily assimilated. Oh. Yes, Is there a Duke of Ors church? Uh, what kind of farming did they do around here? You haven't gone to this was, the, yeah, this was the most wonderful, and it really bugs me to tell you the truth today. Because everybody, every Duke of Ors here has got a little plot of land, and here we have a couple of wonderful trees. Uh, apricots and apples and you see the orchard there. It was a wonderful fruit growing area. Mm -hmm. But when they first came, uh, they grew flax. Uh, you look at that case there and you'll see oats and barley. Uh, th there was lots of very, very productive land. But when the Duke of Ors uh, kind of went broke or bust in 1938 and whatever, uh, not many people took up the challenge and continued to grow orchard. In our area now, Preston, is, is probably, you might, might be passing through there, is still a bit of a fruit growing area, uh, asparagus, uh, strawberries now, and so on. But <clears throat> here, they, they, if you, when you take the tour later, you'll see they, they had the famous uh, jam factory, Casey Jams, Kootenai Columbia Preserving Works, it was called. They pre sold carloads of, of their jams. It was the most famous in the world. Uh, Peter Verrigan sent it uh, during the war. To, to the soldiers, you know, as kind of help and treats and, and whatnot. So it was very, very productive. And not, not only were they using all of the fruit that they were growing themselves, they were contracting and buying fruit from Preston and from as far away as Kelowna for their for their jet factory. And now, yes, question here? The church. Yeah. Okay, the, the Duke of Ors uh, be, believed in the Russian saying, the uh, building does not sanctify the person, the person sanctifies the building. And so, as, as if God didn't live in icons, he didn't live in churches either. And so the Bible says, wheresoever two or more are gathered in my name, there shall I be. Uh, so they, they met at homes, so they met outside. When they came into these villages, they met in what you would call a social center. Social center were the schools, for the business place, a place where you had entertainments, a place where you had funerals, weddings, uh, whatever. And, and so in, the, in our very area there, when you go to the communal, uh, the communal house, you'll see <coughs> the main part at the front is the kitchen, and that, that was a big area where the eating and cooking and so on went on. And then at the, at the next part of it, downstairs, is what's called Hestinitsa, uh, a living room. And that is, that is where the prayers would be. And they would be meeting there at 6.30 in the morning to sing some hymns and so on before breakfast and uh, that sort of thing. And, and let me m mention one important link 
that I find also sad uh, not to have anymore. And that is in these villages. You, you've all heard the saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And it was in these villages that the, the babushkas and dedushkas, the grandmothers and grandfathers, passed on the culture of the Duke of Boris to the little kids because the mothers and fathers were generally working, and especially the fathers who might be away at the lumber camp or in the jam factory or whatever. But the grandparents were teaching them all the skills. Uh, the grandmothers, basically all of the hymns and prayers, the oral culture, the gardening, the cooking and so on, and the grandfathers would uh, be teaching them all of the skills such as uh, wood carving, because they did made all their own utensils, you'll see, and spoons and ladles and so on, and you made your own rope, you made your own harness. Uh, you'll see all these implements for that in the blacksmith shop. And of course, <clears throat> when uh, they had to move from 1938 to 1961, this link was broken. And, and we have now, you know, kids that are coming here from school, grade threes. We had 60 grade threes here uh, just last week. And uh, one of the kids says to me, oh, my babushka is a duke of war. But I see her, you know, but they see that their grandparents maybe once a month or some special day or a birthday. So, so this kind of organic link is no longer there. And it's kind of a, a, a sad uh, state of affairs because that in a way is what kind of diminishes and helps the Duke of Earth culture to disappear, you know, because it can't be totally artificially held up through this Sunday school and, yes. Following the uh, Second World War, there was a period of time when children were rounded up and put into the New Denver yes. Sanitarium. What's, what was that all about? I'll, I'll give you just a brief account of that. Uh, <clears throat> there was, a, a, amongst the Duke of Ors, a, a, a subgroup that became known as the Sons of Freedom. Uh, basically, they were total Tolstoyans. They didn't believe in, in uh, own land ownership. Uh, many of them didn't believe in the use of animals. Many of them didn't believe in the use of metals. I mean, they were very kind of pure anarchists. Now, first uh, action took place in 1902 in Saskatchewan when they burned the canvas of a binder because they said the Duke of Boris were becoming too materialistic. Uh, Peter Verigan was very pragmatic. He said, you know, first we have to be able to feed our children, then we can talk about the weightier spiritual matters. And so he was not a sympathizer to this. In 1908, <coughs> when uh, the body, the majority of the Duke of Ors, these 5,000, let's say, came, uh, the, some, the Sons of Freedom came with them because they certainly were not going to be swearing out an oath to have a, an independent land and so on and so forth. But when they came here, the one thing that they immediately noticed and that they were horrified at was that in the BC uh, schools of the day, there was military training. Uh, this was thanks to Lord Strathcona, who, who gave huge grants of money to the school divisions and said, we, our educational system has one purpose, and that purpose is to produce model citizens. And the model that we are using is the British model. And in the British model, they had military training and gymnastics and so on. So when the Duke of Wars came and they all of a sudden saw the kids marching around with, with wooden rifles, they, they didn't have real guns, but they, I talked to one teacher, said, oh, they'd be walking around with broomsticks, even and whatever, it was supposed to be a gun. Well, <clears throat> right away, they said, no way are we in the, we're going to send our children to this school. They're going to be simply assimilated. They're going to learn how to go to war and to kill people and so on. And uh, Peter Verigan worked with them. They said, OK, we'll have our own schools. He built many schools to have within the Duke of Or community and, and brought in teachers to teach the children, uh, assuming that they would be able to teach the, the Duke of Or stuff at home and so on. But the Sons of Freedom were the holdouts, and they were maybe 7 or 8 percent of the Duke of Ors, and they absolutely refused to let their children go to school. Uh, they felt that they were being persecuted and robbed by the, by the government. Uh, this brought on the new demonstrations, you know. Jesus said, if a man sue thee for thy coat, give him thy cloak also. And it was a demonstration that they had lost all of their properties. Well, they discovered that this was a terrific shock value. Uh, and uh, the school issue 
still on, <coughs> on the books. See, when they came here, in the prairies, it was not a problem, but when they came here... Uh, there were truant officers, there were curriculums, there were reports to be made, and the Duke of soon found out that they were compelled, they were compelled to send their children to school, but the Sons of Freedom refused. And this climaxed throughout the years, uh, through various demonstrations and so on and so forth, but in the end, uh, the children were seized by, by the Mounties and uh, captured and sent to residential school, but it was more like a residential area, to New Denver, and that is where they were held. And they were held there for years. They could only see their parents with the fence between them for one half hour a month. Uh, that's how it was, and, and when the people finally did come out of there, uh, they were very severely emotionally damaged, I would say. It was, it was a very terrible thing, and uh, there were, uh, you know, efforts made at reparations and apologies and so on, but uh, without result at this point, without result. So, so the, the, the unfortunate thing there is that they tried to kind of get at the parents through the children, you know, they used the children to try and make the parents good citizens. Yes, ma'am. I was interested in this picture at the back of the lady that was a leader of the Duke yeah. Wars in the 1800s and uh, had, in fact, trade, it says there to trade Peter Bergen. Yeah, she, so she, I'm wondering, you know, in light of, of the, the significant role that the women had played in this uh, uh, business with the children, are the women really uh, powerful within the... Uh, uh, yes, there was never uh, a discussion or a question about female equality. Uh, what there was was a kind of a, a roles defined by work. But I'll tell you one reason why there, why there was kind of total equality, and that is the women, you know, when they married some fellow, uh, you know, when they fell in love or whatever. That is why they married. The women were not economically dependent on the husband, you see. If uh, there was a problem or if there was a separation, of, of which I have heard of hardly any, uh, I'm sure there were one or two, uh, <clears throat> Peter Berrigan said it's sinful for people to live together if they do not love each other. Simple. Mm -hmm. they, they shouldn't be together. And that's how simple it was. But because of the original agreement, when they are married, their economics had nothing to do with it. And so the man couldn't threaten to leave the woman, you know, to make her starve, to take the children away, to whatever. And the children, like I said, were basically brought up by the entire village, so they are well, well looked after. And the women were, were well looked after. I'll, I'll tell you one incident where there was a lot of uh, marital discord. And that is when they were planning to move to BC here from Saskatchewan, because most of the women wanted to stay within the communal system. Most of the women wanted to stay within the communal system, because women were maybe like that, or family oriented. Some of the men saw this as an opportunity to become independent farmers and to have their own land, which again, is kind of very natural among certain men. They wanted to assert their independence, you see. And so this was a great rift, and, and there were some separations uh, where the women literally said, okay, if that's the way you feel about it, I am going, uh, you may stay. You know. But that was the biggest, biggest thing that happened. Yes, what is left of the um, community in Cowley and Lundbrick? There's very little. Uh, we have a good friend there, his name is Michael Verrigan. He, he was looking after the hall there. And actually, my father helped to build the hall, and there was there was a wonderful choir. They actually performed in Lethbridge Radio. I remember years ago. I was too too young then. But now uh, the the prayer home, you might call it a prayer home, but it was really the social center, has now become uh, an Alberta historic artifact. Mm -hmm. So it will be preserved, and it is still used for gatherings. They're going to have a Peter's Day there too on Sunday. Just as, just as we are going to have here. But the community is very, very small. There's a few people in Belgium. There's still a few people around Cowley, one or two in Pincher Creek. But when they have these events, 
it's usually people that come from Lethbridge and Calgary and so on to make it to make it live sort of thing. Mm. So it's just a matter of, you know, people dying out and children moving away. I mean, I'm no longer there. Right. Hardly anyone I know. Yes, sir. Yes, just outside of um, Grand Forks, we go through the program every year up to the coast. There are two large, two and a half story buildings yeah. in the lab. I've heard several different stories about that. Anyway, were they Duke War Homes or was it the two brothers? That just no, no, they were they were they were a typical Dukabor village. They were uh, one of the thirty there. It was called the Alzarov village. Uh, the reason they fell into such disrepair was in 1961 when the government felt uh, wanted to sell everything. They resurveyed all of the Dukabor land into kind of town-sized lots and so on. And what happened there is kind of interesting because, of course, they weren't thinking of anything, you know, in a social sense. The survey line came between those buildings. And I knew that one man, um, his name was Gabe Potovinikov, who, who lived in one of, those one of those buildings. He's a Duke of War from Castlegar here. This is where his parents were. And he had a native wife, and they wanted to start a bed and breakfast. You know, it's just a wonderful location. But the, the person who owned the other building on the other side of the line wanted to do nothing except watch it fall apart. I mean, each time I go by there, it's a little worse. Now the roof is caving in. So. And so it looked so ugly and unwholesome that nobody ever wanted to stop, you know, for the better one of the bed and breakfast. And now I don't even know if he's there anymore. But that, you know, that is the sort of thing that, that went on. <clears throat> if you look carefully, the next time you're driving by there and you're going farther down the hill and just before you make the turn and you look down in the valley, is another wonderful Duke of War home. It's been restored and it is just beautiful. It, you know, some family bought it, obviously, and wanted to live there and, and they just, you know, rebuilt it and, and kept it up. And uh, while we're on that, the first building that was built here in 1908 is either you going to go to the Salmo Way if you go back or not. Yeah, yeah you'll see it on the right. It has a tin roof now. Very first building in 1908, and a professor from uh, Calgary has bought it, and he's restoring it. He's been here looking at our plans, and we've sold him some bricks and so on and so forth. And so, you know, some of this uh, is still continuing, and, and he's doing a wonderful job. He's uh, Modernizing it where necessary, you know, putting in good windows and whatnot. But uh, the bu the buildings themselves are very solid, and in a way, that that is kind of what helped destroy them. Because when they went for sale in 1961, uh, <clears throat> many people bought them just for the materials, just for the bricks, you know, just for the wonderful wood. I mean, that, this was number one wood that you will never see anymore. You know, like three inch planks that are 12 feet long and so on. So that's basically privately owned down through there now. They're all privately owned. There, there's one or two in this in this area right here that are very well restored. You know where a Dukeboer family is living, but it's all under private hands. Yes, sir. Uh, when David uh, married his first wife, a Dukeboer lady, was she shunned? <laughs> <laughs> you start with the zoo. Uh, this. Uh, First wife was a Dukeborn lady. Uh, well, his first girlfriend was. So they didn't marry. Uh, <coughs> so no, but but the, but the thing of shunning is interesting. There there was no shunning, uh, and interestingly enough, you know the Dukeborns never proselytized. They never came out, you know, like say the Jehovah Witnesses and said, you know, we have a better way and so on. Uh, the, the the people that came to become Dukeborns. Uh, came because of their own sense, because it was a, you know, a humanistic tradition, it made sense. You know, the reason the Duke of Wars formed was they wanted to get rid of all the ritual and the magic and the superstition. You know, this, this has nothing to do with, with uh, spirituality, with belief in, in God and, and, and whatnot. And so, <clears throat> the people that did come to them, there, there was intermarriage. Uh, they were, they were, uh, it, about, about the different parts of the Russian Empire, and they intermarried with local people. They, they were in, the, in the, uh, the Milky Waters in the Ukraine, where other Ukrainians joined them. 
Same thing on the Canadian prairies. So they never uh, really went out and sought uh, adherence, put it that way, but many people came to them. Now, if someone wanted to leave the community, uh, they, they were made to feel that that was their privilege and, and their right, and they were able to leave. And this not only applied to the women, and some did, of course, but you know, the, you have to remember that the family th thing was very strong. Yes? So this uh, courtship, was it discouraged? Between David and his girlfriend. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but, but I, I would say there was probably a, a good chance that it was. Because the uh, basically the, the Duke of Wars had a word for it. And uh, I'm a little uh, too young to kind of be in the thick of this because I was born after the community collapsed and, and whatnot. And so anything that I know is, is what I've been told. But I know in the Duke of Wars, uh, language or lexicon is a word called nashe, which means ours, okay? And uh, <clears throat> the conversation might go, well, she's seeing this fellow, and they would say, oh, one nashe, is he ours? <laughs> and she said, no, no nashe, no, not ours. <laughs> Ache, who, who is, is he? Anglik, Anglik, which is a loose translation of English. But <laughs> in, the, in the Duke of War language, everybody who was not a Duke of War was an Anglique. <laughs> so, that, so they, you know, he might have been Japanese or, or East Indian or whatever, but you know, Anglique. Okay, so they did have this sense that, you know, they, they, they were not arranged marriages, but they, they, were, they would kind of try and select and say, oh, well, you know, that Masha is such a nice suitability uh, companion for our page. You know, there were the parents kind of colluding about, <laughs> about how they would marry uh, someone. I, I can tell you another joke about that. Uh, and there was a, a Duke of Bourg dinner, and the, the man was there. He married the Duke of Bourg girl, but he, who knows what he what he was, uh, English, whatever. And so someone uh, asked him, or one of the parents said, are you finding everything companionable? And say, oh yeah, everything's fine. And he said, well, did, did she teach you any Russian words? And he said, oh yeah. He said, well, I, I, I learned one Russian word at least that I know very well by now. He said, oh yeah, what is it? Ninash. <laughs> <laughs> because he had heard it whenever the family gathered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, but no shouting. <laughs> yes, sir. So with the abundance of all the fish in the area and being mostly vegetarian, did David teach her how to fish? Or <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I say, but I will tell you this. Jukobors were vegetarian, but when they came here, and uh, there were no gardens and food was scarce, uh, they, they didn't draw the line at catching fish and, and eating them as long as they had to. Uh, later on, it was no longer necessary. The same thing happened in Saskatchewan. And this, again, was part of the pragmatism of Peter Berry. You know, he was sensible. He was, you know, if you're going to starve, you know, he, he, somebody asked me, he said, oh, okay, Tushka, what would you do? If you were starving to death and you came across this corpse of an old dog or something, so would you eat it? He said, of course I would eat it. He said, the first thing you do is preserve yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you can do something with yourself mm -hmm. to help people, to whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to die just on principle, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. unless it has to do with pacifism or, or, or a big principle. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You, you're aware of the Hutterites. Yes, very much so. Uh, they were friends and supporters of the Duke of Boris. Okay. And there so, are parallels. Well, my question is, how do you compare uh, the Duke of Boris to the Hutterites? Okay, the, the, there, the, there are the common, differences. Yeah, there are common things. The communal living, uh, the desire to preserve the culture and the sense of teaching the language to the children, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> vegetarianism, no. The, the Hutterites were not vegetarians and uh, pacifism, certainly, and then the other big falling away is that uh, the Hutterites and Mennonite still had their own clergy of a sort, oh, yeah. whereas yes. the Duke of Boris simply had their elders, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it could be anyone. When they have the prayer meetings, their little kids are encouraged to say something 
or a prayer or whatever, as well as the elders. But the connection is strong because in the 17, uh, well, about probably 1750 to about 1830, they were both exiled, the Anabaptists then, they were a group, Mennonites, Hutterites, etc., Anabaptists, had left Europe because they were being persecuted by the Catholic Church. And you know the, what went on there with this, their uh, inquisitions and all this. Anyway, so they came to Russia for freedom, and of course they weren't members of the Orthodox Church, so when the Dukovors were banished to the Crimea, to the Milky Waters, so were the Anabaptists. And there they lived happily, side by side, until Alexander I, about uh, 1835, I would say, uh, said, okay, now you must join the Orthodox Church and become Russian citizens, or you will be exiled further. And at that time, that is when we first had our uh, Anabaptists coming to North America. They came to the States and they came to Canada. And at that time, the Duke of Boris were exiled further into the Caucasus. And that's where they stayed until they came to Canada. When they came to Canada, to the Middle Prairies, uh, and, and, um, you know, and the people, that's, I don't understand certain things, Central Canada. Central Canada is, is Winnipeg. The dead center of Canada is about Winnipeg. It is not Toronto, it is not Ottawa. But, <laughs> right? but we're told. <laughs> So let's get to, let's get it straight. So when they came to Central Canada, once again they were neighbors, and the Mennonites and the Hutterites helped the Dukovors when they were first starting out. The other group that helped them a lot was the Society of Friends, uh, the, the Quakers. Uh, you'll see sewing machines here, old singers, and so on. And uh, the Quakers of America sent up sewing machines to help them, and uh, so on and so forth. And, and it was the fact that there were Mennonite or Hutterite settlements in the prairies that in a way prompted the idea that the Duke of Wars could settle in central Canada as well. And this was thanks to Prince Peter Kropotkin, who, who is an anarchist and an agronomist, and he had traveled across Canada. And so when James Maver was writing to Tolstoy about where could we possibly find a place for the Duke of Wars, Kropotkin said, they, they would work very well in central Canada because I have seen the Hutterites and how successful they, their farming there and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did they, um, were they restrict, were you restricted in the clothing like the Hutterites? No. no, they had traditional clothing and, and they had, uh, you know, going way, way back, uh, the idea that women covered their heads, so they were these wonderful <coughs> head scarves, beautifully embroidered and so on and so forth. Nobody really knows where that comes from, and when they when they're into the prayer meetings, uh, the women, the men are supposed to not be wearing hats. But aside from that, uh, now of course they don't do this very much. Uh, when we see this event here next Sunday, the coming Sunday, we probably will have many women dressed in traditional clothing. But but it was never a big issue, like you know the, the Mennonites or the Hutterites would wear black or. Some would wear not allow zippers because it was too, you know yeah. that was not a problem. Uh, they used the clothing for and you'll see many of their clothing, beautiful clothing from linen. They made the best linen, you know, and they and before that hemp, hemp clothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, ma'am. When the Dukovors left Russia, did they go anywhere else besides Canada? When they came did to they, Canada? Yeah. Did yeah. any? Uh, uh, yes, some went to the United States, but what happened was many places were considered. Uh, England, not enough land, Cyprus, climate wrong, they, they had a party there for a while and 10% of them died of malaria. Uh, they thought of Hawaii, uh, they thought of Texas, they thought of Georgia, there was a commune in Georgia in the States that wanted them to come. But the best deal was given by Clifford Sifton in terms of helping their their uh, movement onto the prairies and so on and so forth. Once they, they did get here though, some people said, oh, they really wanted to grow fruit and so on and so forth. And so some went to California, but they went as individuals, you know, not as... There was a, a Duke of War settlement for a while in Oregon, uh, near uh, Eugene, Oregon. But eventually uh, there wasn't enough of a movement and the, the land was sold. So there was never really a, a, a great move 
besides. There was another uh, Russian group, uh, kind of related to the Duke of Orris, called the Molokans, that did settle in a big group in, in California. And, they, and it's kind of a community that's sort of dying out now. But they were, they, they were keeping in touch because of their Russian ancestry and so on and so forth. And, and they were a big group. They had their own hall and their newspaper and so on. But and now they're pretty much assimilated. All right.